When I was 36, which in my mind was only a short time ago, <laughs> I, was, I was living in Manhattan, and I had carved out a 500-square-foot apartment for myself. I had lived there for five years. It was on the fifth floor, five flights up, no elevator, built in 1885. And what made this place so enduring is that everything was leaning towards the left because the building foundation was sagging. So in short, the building was falling it down. So I began to think about, is, am I ever going to have a piece of the Big Apple? And I started to think, what if I had that weekend house? And what if I had that weekend house as an investment? Now, as most of you will know, weekend house and investment are opposite sides of the spectrum. <laughs> so here lies the comedy of errors, because that investment, <laughs> and investment being the operative word here, became my money pit. <laughs> so uh, I found a wonderful little town in western Connecticut called New Milford, Connecticut, founded in 1712. And it was one of those sort of New England towns that had a, a town square, um, little quaint shops, the type that sell fresh ground coffee, things where gingham plaid things are sold, <laughs> things made of cinnamon and nutmeg are found. <laughs> and you're pretty darn certain that George Washington stayed there during the Revolutionary War, thus making it an investment sure to yield an 8 to 10 percent uh, return on the investment, is how I saw it. And I could have been more wrong. <laughs> so, I found this great little yeah. cottage. <laughs> Quaint, 900 square feet on three and a half acres overlooking the Housatonic River. It was incredible. I was charmed. It had cedar shank siding, a cedar roof, uh, eight over eight pane windows, two working fireplaces, double ovens in the kitchen. Stop me if I sound like the real estate agent. <laughs> like, it even had these two little quarter window attic windows, just like in the movie Animaville Horror. <laughs> What is Dutch colonial revival for 500? What is this, Jeopardy? I was charmed, crazed, and out of my mind, and I bought the house. So, when you buy a house, you want to share it. And in this case, I invited some people up for the weekend. Now, what made this house so special was, it was located at 65 Hind Hill Road, which I later named to 2020 Hindsight Hill Road. <laughs> so that first weekend up there, people come up, we're going to rake leaves, decompress, drink some wine by the fire, and have a good time. And something had crawled under the house and died. <laughs> some animal. And it wasn't the party animal that I had come to know in New York, but more like some animal seeking refuge. And it crawled under that space just that wasn't big enough to get under, and the smell was awful. So, scented candles, uh, air freshener, a few bottles of wine, and they're leaving. But what about the leaves? You helped me, you're gonna help me rape. <laughs> and they told me, another time, another life. <laughs> For the next five years, I renovated this house. I met with general contractors every Saturday morning, because, <laughs> With that degree in architecture, I didn't need a general contractor. I knew exactly what needed to be done. I was going to be Jim Bob, home improvement guy, get her done. <laughs> <laughs> no one was going to stand in my way. You feel me, Vern? <laughs> so for those next five years, I recited the house with white cedar. I redid the roof complete with copper trim valleys. I repointed those 8 over 8 pane windows to match the Benjamin Moore uh, historic color brochure. <laughs> I even found a contractor that refused to use a nail gun. He said using a nail gun would interrupt the architectural integrity of the house. Ooh. This guy was as nuts as I was. <laughs> we became friends. <laughs> Shortly after September 11, 2001, I lost my job as a result of 9-11. And I continued to live in Manhattan, and this weekend house became my escape. The 
place that I went to to seek refuge and solitude, and it allowed me to think about what was important and what mattered to me in life. And about nine months later, white knuckled from hanging on, <laughs> I began to realize I needed a new reality to my dream. So I sold this house in the loss of 50, 60,000, whatever. <laughs> And I remember handing over the keys, <laughs> thinking, are those new owners, are, are they going to see that crawl space? Are they going to see the cracks in the dining room wall? Are they going to notice these animal or windows? <laughs> no. They had the same rose-colored glasses on as I did. And... They had their own set of dreams that needed to be shattered. <laughs> <laughs> Who was I to rain on their parade? Besides, I, I was the one losing in this deal. So on the train ride back to New York, I had tears. You cry. You cry for the loss. You cry for the sadness. The dream is no longer there. I cried for those Saturday mornings, meeting with a contractor who was about to hose me for another $2,500. <laughs> and it's only years later that I can look back and get some sort of reflection and perspective on this 65 High Hill Road and think, what did that all mean? Well, it means the hindsight and what that house is worth now. <sighs> <laughs> And that's the beauty of hindsight, because if you stick around long enough, everything changes. And I always think, well, I wonder what animal crawled under the house this year to die. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>